Um, to stay true to our um, title and subject, I would love to have um, both of you uh, speak to what the promise of an acorn is for you, what oak ecosystems mean to you. Um, even if you just, and I know that's really hard, because having spoken to you last week, I know there's so many stories, so many things. But if you could pick something from your experience that will help open our eyes to the ways um, that you see these incredible beings. And uh, Skip, let's start with you. Jerry, go. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, for y'all because he's the man that wrote the book. <laughs> I've been listening to Skip for the last two hours in the library, and I would just be happy to continue listening to Skip. <laughs> but uh, maybe I'll tell uh, a little story about a wasn't necessarily an acorn, but uh, I, I'm <laughs> practicing better ecology and thought I was pretty smart when I came to ecology. And then when my son uh, went off to join the Marines to be with him a little longer, we went downstairs to look at his bedroom. <laughs> if you've ever been a habit of a parent, been a parent of a teenager, you can imagine how a challenge that might be. <laughs> anyway, think being somewhat scientifically minded, uh, we thought perhaps an archaeological dig, <laughs> looking for statistically significant evidence that even the local uh, junior college had found only trend they read us along that line. <laughs> but we found a lot of uh, watered up homework assignments and notes from little girls. You could tell the little girls got their little girl writing with the little how they do. <laughs> and, uh, and, but they used language that we would never have used even in a locker room. <laughs> but anyway, around the eighth grade level, uh, there was a watered up homework assignment that was in the five paragraph style. At least he had five clumps of words. There were introductory paragraphs, supposedly uh, three expository paragraphs, and a summary paragraph. <laughs> Basically, this is about the eighth grade level. Uh, it was a complaint. The all we lived in this classic suburb in Chicago uh, at that time with uh, well, the anyway. And uh, he complained that all the trees in our neighborhood weren't really alive, they just weren't exactly dead. He said they were more like prisoners of war or concentration camp victims growing there because they died in the war and replaced them, that there were no children plants. And he said that. Uh, that uh, the adults, he said, the only free tree in the neighborhood as he put was a cottonwood tree down by the school to which he and his buddies would go and probably cleave to and read the wrong magazines and smoke. <laughs> and I have evidence for both of them. <laughs> but uh, in any event, he claimed that, uh, that every once in a while the cottonwood tree would have children. And the adults would come kill them and mow them down. Then finally the adults came and cut down the cottonwood tree because maybe a limb would fall on somebody. And that was the last of life in our neighborhood. And I, this is going on in the mind of this little boy until he became a Marine. And I realized that the way the world works is that each seed is born, like each acorn is born, is born with a combination of genes that the Earth's never seen before or will ever see again. Born at the time that's never been before or ever be again. And if this acorn or this seed falls into a habitat nearly identical to one in which the parent is born, there would others of this generation, all subtly different, but with, with all of them with the genetic memory, the anatomy, the morphology, the physiology, and a thousand, thousand things that Western science can see or measure, they're unable to be strong and grow in the place and with others of the generation, respond to the subtle vicissitudes of changing times on the earth at the rates which mountains rise and fall, and the earth can make itself new again. And then I realized then that this is, that simply because we planted the plant and it doesn't die right away, that doesn't make it alive. That uh, what we have, what we've done with our architecture, our landscape architecture, our infrastructural aesthetic, is we have designed away children, designed away the first capacity to make itself new again. And so, part of the idea in my mind of an acorn is not just planting an acorn to see it grow, but making sure that it grows in a habitat so that its children will have a home. And actually, on our website, there's a little essay I wrote on how to plant a loving home for a tree which gives you an idea about what you might do with an acorn if you wanted to plant one. But uh, maybe that's one of those.
well uh, for native people. The oak tree is a history. Um, there's like three ways that native people use an oak tree. They use the mast for the acorns for food. They use the tree for utility purposes. And by utility purposes, I mean everything from dugout canoes to uh, wood for lodges, wood for uh, spatulas and things of that nature, all different kinds of implements. Uh, and more importantly, it's used uh, for ceremony in a spiritual way. Um, when you travel the old roads, the old trails in this general geographic area, you're walking and a lot of times driving on what used to be Indian trails. And on those Indian trails, the people, when they walked, of course, they didn't have horses right away. And back in the day, when those trails were made, and they walked those trails, they would make maybe 15, 20 miles a day, if they were fortunate, especially if they had kids with. So they would look for a place to stop. The old grove was the solution to that problem. Oak groves became our best westerns back then. <laughs> so you're on the trail, you come to an oak grove, and they would try to find ones that had water uh, close by. They weren't stupid. They would need to get refreshed, need to get rehydrated. Uh, a lot of times, the ones that I've seen that we know were used in that manner have boulders that were moved into place to use as like a table or some place to put your stuff. And a lot of times, there would be a small wigwam there. And it was incumbent on anybody that stopped there to use that to leave it in good order when you went on down the road. Now, to mark these places, there became a system of trees that mark the trails, called marker trees. Uh, and what those were, were young trees that were taken and twisted in a manner, sometimes they would be tied and twisted in the shape of a figure four. Sometimes they would just be tied in a simple knot. And as those trees grew, they were indicators. They did the same thing further up north. Of, I'm up, from up in Wisconsin, and up in there we had a lot of the, uh, boulders with uh, quartz lines in them. And they did the same thing with those. Those were indicators. They indicated either the best western was down the road, or that maybe there was a ford in the river that you want to take, uh, or that there might be a branch in the trail. And so that was there. A few of those are still around. Not too many, but a few of them are still around. Uh, we have a gathering up at Zion late in August. And it's called Potawatomi Trails Powwow. And what it's all about is those old trail marker trees. Because there is one in that general geographic area. So for native people, it, it, it's, it's more than just a tree. It's all of those things. It was a place where there were weddings, marriages performed under those trees. Uh, places where burials were placed up on scaffolds in the trees. Especially if somebody died while you were traveling away from your village. Those bodies would be placed up there and then they would come back and collect the bones at a later date. Uh, and then those would be interred. But initially, 
those bodies were put up in those trees and scaffolds were made to hold them up. So, uh, I guess I'm holding this one. He's making noise. <laughs> I think you're holding it right and talking into it with wonderful insight and wisdom. Um, gosh, as you speak, the line I was going to ask, and I'm still going to ask, who are we in relation then to these trees? You know, what does it mean to be a human being? As you're talking, Skip, I see some of the lines blurring. You know, even if you're putting your your dead up in the tree, you know, where does that where do the individuals start and stop? Um, but I know you both have a lot of interesting things to say on what it means to be human in relation to these trees. So I won't try to suggest who goes first this time. <laughs> okay. Um, in our cultural way, and I know that there's a few people here with, with Native background, in our cultural way, following the traditional ways of our tribes is called traveling the red road. Pretty simple terminology, you follow the red road, that means you, you go by the rules and regulations and protocols and all that kind of stuff. And all that stuff is about is just being a good person, living your life in a good way. Uh, the rules and regulations aren't horribly difficult. They're things like humility, they're things like uh, honesty, there's things of that nature. So we're not talking about some brain buster stuff. But an elder told me a long, long time ago, he said, the first step on the red road is from here to here. So people will come to us and they'll say, uh, can, can we take part in the stuff that you do? Because we do sweat lodges and sunrise ceremony and powwows and all that stuff. And the answer is always yes, because it's about what's in your heart, not what's in your veins anymore. Not all of us look like the head side of an old nickel. Uh, we've been absorbed, a lot of us. My family background is uh, Potawatomi, Canadian, French on my mother's side. On my father's side, he was a Polish kid from the south side of Chicago. And during the Great Depression, he graduated from high school and had no prospect of work. So he joined the Civilian Conservation Board, the CCs. Now, see a lot of people shaking their heads, and for you that don't know it, basically, that was President Roosevelt's tree army. They went to the North Woods and replanted all the trees that the lumber barons had stripped. They reforested the northern tier of the United States. So he was posted out in California and Idaho and then eventually northern Wisconsin where he met my mother and as they say the rest is history. So it's really about what's in your heart and that's where you got to start and once you make that connection and I'm not just talking about the road, road I'm talking about anything follow your heart with your mind don't forget to throw your heart into the mix. That's a tough question. <laughs> but, you know, that what is a human? You know, Steinbeck tried to get at this a little bit. You know, he needs to be it. I mean, that uh, novel. And basically, he concluded that everybody who was around 
the humanity was defined not by how you looked like, but what what the scriptures say what's in your heart. And those people who you who, who can rue and regret what they do and rejoice or what, what when they when they make a mistake or when they can rejoice when they do something well, that was considered human. And he said those people who were you look in the eyes, you can't see any soul, you can't see that capacity to rue and regret or to rejoice, that they're not human in his mind. They're just things that are walking around looking like humans. Well, I also came at this uh, as a, from a scientific standpoint. It was taught uh, my, uh, uh, that basically a human being was something you could key out in a piece of field guide to mammals. You know, it had um, all the things that a, that a human being was supposed to have according to the archaeologist and, and the anthropologist, and they define what a human is. And so I was having looked into uh, a number of Indian uh, languages that often the name they call themselves for example, the Shawnee, the Shawanat, they call themselves the human beings, or the real people. And this is commonly seen over and over again in how the names, with the translated them, they're the human beings, the Illinois, where the, the complete or perfect man, however, how, however the Jesuits or whoever translated it, that came up like that. Now, I thought, well, that's kind of a quite chauvinistic notion. If the Shawanat, they were human beings, well, then who were the Kickapoo and the Menominee? Were they not human as well? A long time, then I was reading of an event that occurred, and uh, when the Shawnee, there were seven sets of the Shawnee, and all of them got together about in, in the autumn, I believe it was the autumn of 1779, and they decided they couldn't handle the white people coming across the Ohio anymore and doing all the things that white people do that wasn't very nice to people. And they, about 60% of the tribe, thought they should go west and get away. And so they, uh, another 40%, including Tecumseh and, and his people, decided to stay and fight. But anyway, they sent, but they had to send elders out to the, far away to the Southern Illinois district. And they came back quite afraid because in 1769, at the end of the Pontiac War, most of the Illinois tribes were gone and had, had perished by either leaping off the rocks and starved off or no. in some other way were, were gone from that state. They could not find anyone to teach them the way of Southern Illinois, to how to care for all of the brothers and sisters around you, how to, because all of the resources necessary for life had to be within walking distance. And all of the brothers and sisters, the plants and the animals, the soil, the water, had to be curated, loved, understood, in a, in, the, in a kind of way that those plants and animals would respond and give the people what they needed. And I realized that as they came back frightened that they couldn't find anybody who knew the way of Southern Illinois. And so the people of the Shawnee vanished along those western trails. And I realized that they find humanity in terms of how they related to all of the brothers and sisters. Were they knowledgeable enough, engaged with them enough to care for them? and that their humanity would be defined that way. And I'm reminded of a story, I actually put a little thing on the, our website about this called the Human Beings of the North Branch, just to make it kind of quick. They, uh, there was a, back in 1979, interestingly enough, which is 200 years later, uh, there was a group of people on the North Branch of the Chicago River who started trying to cut off the buckthorn and the honeysuckle and whatnot. And uh, they came to the people at the Field Museum, the Mountain Arboretum, the Botanic Garden, all, all the ologists, as to, <laughs> and actually, well, uh, box elders and uh, uh, sugar maples and ashes are native, should we cut those too? And all of the ologists with the cloth beards, the corduroy jackets and the biology looking clothes, uh, <laughs> said, oh, you should do this and do that, but different answers. And so they, but they started listening more to the plants and animals themselves and seeing how the plants and animals responded to what they were doing because the plants and animals were not tenure-track, ego-driven, governed by doctors. <laughs> they don't lie, they don't cheat, and they have no uh, ego. And so they were discovering real truths by listening to the plants. And after a while, they were becoming quite successful on the North Branch and bringing back butterflies uh, that people hadn't seen in 100 years, uh, plants that had, had re were re-emerging, becoming quite uh, impressive. And I remember going one time and there were the adults of the North Branch were out there cutting buckthorn and honeysuckle and doing this, but the, the sort of the teenage uh, North Branchers were out there, the boys dangling around on branches and climbing trees trying to impress little girls who were looking up <laughs> and supposedly in awe. 
out of these trips. <laughs> and then the little boys and girls were going to do what little boys and girls do with sticks, and some will maybe make it little houses, and the old boys have big sword fights, or whatever. But it was like a little family out in the North Branch. And I remember one, one of these North Branches went into the far and distant land of Southern, Southern Cook County, in you know, the Palos area, where the group had also been doing the same thing. We went with the lockers and all ready to go cut buckthorn, but you wouldn't dream of cutting a buckthorn there at the Palos if you're a North Brancher, because that's where the people of the Palos were the human beings, and the North Branchers were others. And so you have to ask permission. And so I would submit that part of our, our, our humanity comes in the extent to which uh, you are engaged with all of the brothers and sisters in the place where you live and are caring for them and love them for their own sake, not just for what you can quantify or extract from them or sell them. And so that in a very real way, all of you who are stewards or involved in stewardship and restoration are in a very real sense uh, reclaiming, re-engaging your humanity. And so I would say that humanity is, and, and that would be the summary of how you how to simply we, we relate to all of our brothers and sisters. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. I, I read a piece on this and uh, that Jerry uh, wrote, and we discussed this a little bit last week, but what I told him on the phone was that it was so wonderful to have my heart opened again to what it might mean to be a human being and to remember um, things that we've forgotten about being a human being and relating to our brothers and sisters, human and otherwise. Um, you guys have treasures, things around your necks. Um, <laughs> and while your story is scientific, I you strike me as not the typical scientist. And I have a feeling you look through that lens uh, differently <coughs> than, or let's say, unusually and remarkably. <laughs> I don't know what is around your neck, uh, Skip, and I would love to know. I know a couple of the things in there you showed, but please share with us your lens on the world and how you see, uh, or my, how you, how some of the things you've brought identify either your humanity, going back to this again, or um, Oaks. And maybe you do want to start with some of your old treasures down there. Sure. Um, I brought a few things that are kind of indicative of, and I'm going to stand up to do. Uh, I mentioned that oak trees were cut and used for all different kinds of utility uses, one of which was the big canoe. The dugout was generally cut using axes like this. This, you, you guys have one over at the Dunn Museum that's just like this, it's a little bit smaller though. Um, but they're shaped the same. And um, archeologists have told me that this came from what was referred to as the archaic period. How long ago was that? Uh, six, eight thousand years. That's how old this piece is. And the cool thing about this piece is that walking around near where I have a sweat lodge up in Wisconsin, we're always looking at the ground looking for stones. Okay? Because we call them grandfathers. They come up out of the ground. They were made long before there were any of us around. And that's what we use. They give up their life force in the sweat lodge. So we're always looking. So I walk by this, I see this groove sticking up out of the ground as I walk by and I walked on by and did a, one of those OMG moments. <laughs> and I turned around and looked at the ground and went, that's man-made. That groove is man-made. But what's really cool is that this is shaped just like yours down at the museum. And when I saw that one at the museum, you, and you look at this one, it's like the same guy made it. 
and we're really not that far. I'm just up here in the southeastern part of the Wisconsin. So we're not that terribly far apart from this area down here. I don't think you guys have any history information about where that was. Uh, I don't know for sure. It was brought from, but, uh, but still, it's really neat. So the some of the ologists that um, have attempted to duplicate the efforts of Native people um, talked about how they tried the burning and cutting. So how do they take down a tree with this kind of stuff? Always the story was that they started a fire around the tree, they packed the top of the tree with mud, and then started this fire. And they let the fire burn, and then put the fire out, and took their stone implements, and chipped away the burnt stuff, and then started the fire again, put new mud on it, and they kept doing this until they brought the tree down. How long would that take? Uh, very, very long time. It might take you a couple weeks to get one of those trees to come down, depending on the size of it. And then when they brought it down, they did basically the same process again. To hollow that thing out, they would lay out fires on top of the log, pack the edges again with mud, start the fire, take the tools, chip it out, and, and that would go on and on until they finally got that tree hollowed out in the shape of a dugout canoe. Now, those are very common artifacts that are found in a, a lot of lakes, especially lakes uh, here in the Midwest where they have to do some kind of drainage work on them, and they drain them, or they put a dam in, and start to drain a certain area, all of a sudden they pop up with those dugout canoes. Mm. And quite often they're made out of oak. Mm -hmm. And they're referred to as mishuns in our language. Um, so uh, that was a very important thing as far as utility. Usually those trees that would cut down three by the water. Um, <coughs> you know. So so that's a big part of it. And I don't want to go overboard with this stuff, but um, the another utility use, when we look at the oaks, we see those beautiful burls, right? Everybody, everybody can identify with that. Well, those things are really cool. If you've ever cut one off of a tree that's come down, sometimes you find that they're hollow, completely hollow already. With a little work, you know, and I'm talking about a lump on a log that might look like this, and then you cut it off and you got a good head start on a cup or a bowl. And then with a little work, you end up with this rascal here. These, in our language, are called noggins. <laughs> okay, so, and you go, well, yeah, I've heard of noggins before. That's an English word for a cup that looks like what you're holding. Well, if you go to your Funkin' Wagnalls and look up the word noggin, it will refer to it as a cup or a small bowl. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the origin of the word, you will find out that it's unknown origin. <laughs> we know. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> spoons. Uh, this is a typical woodland native spoon. And spoons were usually a branch that was either broken off or cut off. And uh, the shape generally would have some kind of an effigy on it. You have a little bear up on top of this one. <laughs> Um, they were big, like this, and um, they always got a big kick out of the fact that the Europeans, when they came and ate with them, had these little tiny spoons. <laughs> and they always said, you know, 
Yeah, we'll give them our share. <laughs> 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 So, um, one other point I wanted to make real quick, and then I'll sit down here. This is a scapula bone from a buffalo. All right. Now, the reason I brought this is that we have all kinds of stuff that we use buffaloes for. Uh, back in the day, uh, there were the Ho Chunk people, Winnebago's. They have a list that they made up of 58 different ways to use a buffalo. 58. It was like going to Walmart. You could get any. You could get clothes, you could get tools, implements, food, decorations, all kinds of stuff from, from that tool. As a whole, were commonly used, at, or sometimes a shovel. Um, so, uh, the relationship of the buffalo to the oak savanna ecosystem, um, Jerry and I were talking about this before, was exceptionally relevant. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that bison were very common here, and some of the ologists uh, have said that uh, around 1400, that there was massive numbers of buffalo in the Illinois and southern Wisconsin prairies. Um, the Jesuits, when they start coming around, um, if you ever want to read some good stuff about it, explanations, descriptions, check out the Jesuit relations. That's what they called their reports back to France. They were probably the most well-educated guys that, at that time that were here in North America, back in the 1500s, 1600s. And those guys uh, had great descriptions of the buffalo herds and stuff being, um, there was one, his name was Father, now I, can, now I can't remember his name. Um, okay. Alloway, maybe? Oh. Uh, who wrote about down around the Kankakee River, the massive herds of buffalo bison that were down that area. But to come back up here around, the way I understand it, there's a difference between the oak savannah combination and woods oak combination. And that one, those oak trees out on those savannas grow bigger and allow for furry grasses and things like that to surround them more than we have all this undergrowth here. So the bottom line was that that supplied food for the buffalo. And the buffalo would come up in those areas. And they assumed that the reason that native people started to burn the prairies was to renew that food source for the bison as well as the elks. Because all that were here. And very, very important food source. Twice a year, the native people would launch buffalo hunts and as well as for the elk. So, like I said, the Ho Chunk people had that list of 58 different things that you could do with that buffalo besides make a hole. So that was relative. I'm just going to mention this briefly and I'll stop. Um, I said, when Catherine called me and started laughing, and she said, so we started talking about talking about the oak, right? You know, and I'm kind of going, yeah, OK, that's relevant for us. Gee, as a matter of fact, my regalia has <laughs> and the reason that that's on there is that that's my family. That's the boys are the leaves and the acorns are the girls. Acorns are women's. They reproduce. And there's great distinction still today in the native communities between women's stuff and men's stuff. 
It doesn't mean we're like chauvinistic about it. What it means is that women have a, more of a closeness to the earth than I do. Because of the reproductive ability of a woman, in a native way, she has a connection to the earth. When, uh, you know, native people, it's hard to talk about Midwestern tribes because they were semi-nomadic at times. Uh, every several hundred years, the whole process would change. So you almost have to have a, a timeline to talk specifically about native stuff. But, that being said, um, when they moved and traveled from one place to another during their industrial year, uh, like say they left their winter camp to go to the sugar bush to make maple sugar, the women took care of the lodges and picked where they were going to put those and where the fires should be, and then they would make the fires and stuff. But as far as placement of a lodge or any of that stuff, that was, women did that. And it, again, it wasn't, women were in charge of taking care of the gardens. It was all about that connection to Mother Earth. So anyway, there you have it, the job of the men was all about protecting the family. Um, there's a word that we use, kind of a general word, it's Ogichida. Ogichida is, we, a lot of times are referred to as warriors. But Ogichida was also a guy that was a good hunter and took good care of his people. So, okay. First, thank you so much for sharing all of that. That was beautiful. Um, I wanted to clarify or maybe add to my question for you, which, you know, I mentioned your lens and your lens as a scientist, um, even though you bring so many different disciplines to your work. But one thing in particular I just wanted to add was thinking through the lens of language and how you think um, that informs how we see oaks and the ecosystems around us. I know you have very good thoughts on that. Well, I think language is a really difficult problem uh, in understanding the landscape, which is one of my major research issues, is how do you understand what is the human relationship with the land around us here? And how do we come to know the brothers and sisters and how to, hand, how to be nice to them so they won't cry, they'll be happy? Well, uh, the white scientists have argued strenuously and still do over, for example, what is a savanna. They, uh, they, have came, they came from the east, their cultural orientation as a scientist were from the eastern forests of sugar maple and beech and this sort of thing. So naturally, their, uh, their orientation is that, and so anything that was different from that must be something else. So they looked around for a word and they started using the word savanna. Uh, actually, savanna is from an Arawakan word of the Arawakan people of the Caribbean that meant something like savanna, that meant flat, grassy plain on the coast, uh, which is picked up by the Spanish and then by the English scientists to describe rolling country with trees who, and uh, about the, the density, which they argue how many, which is interesting, but in any event, that's from which the kind of word savanna comes. So it's, uh, some of you may know who Steve Packard is. Uh, we were at a Savannah conference down in where white scientists, ologists, were getting together and trying to describe for each other how they, with how many, however many referee papers they had, what a, they, a real Savannah is. And they would say, a real Savannah, because I had 14 referee papers to prove it, uh, is 50% canopy cover. I said, but, but Curtis said 80%. And somebody argued over that. Somebody asked Steve Patrick when he came up to speak. They said, Steve, well, what is a savanna tree? And Steve said, a savanna tree is a tree with big nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Which really, actually, there was a lot of silence. <laughs> um, 
And then there was a, a, that, that reaction. Uh, but it's true, the walnuts, the oaks, the hickories, they all have big nuts. Well, anyway, I, I was, had this in mind as I was visiting Walpole Island. It's a place where the Potawatomi, the Dawa, the Ojibwe have a reservation uh, on an island, right? I think I actually call it Island Pacage, but on the place where the river is divided, where the St. Clair comes around. And they've been burning that island since time beyond mine. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous. Tony Rezichek and I went in there on a trip and we found over 250 species of plants in there, uh, just one wandering around period. And, um, but anyway, there's a, a language speaker there, she spoke Ojibwe, and so I hung around her uh, quite a bit and was asking her, as I was wont to do, about this or that plant that she recognized and what she thought about it. And I asked her, the prayer is so beautiful. And so I asked her, I said, Rita, what do you call that? Prairie. She said, well, you must know that our word for one of our words for fire is Shkoda. And then you put the good Algonquian label in front of you. Shkoda. She said it means the burnt of a bare land. She did her hand like that. I thought, oh wow, the burnt of a bare land, Shkoda. And uh, and then I went, we went out to a bed. Then there was a, a bit of trees, actually quite a bit, where there was closed canopy cover. Which I guess, if you had enough to read papers, you could say that was a forest. <laughs> and then there was uh, more open and more open, and then even finally a lone burr oak. But there was the inner gradation was just complete. Not the oh, this confused the bee Jesus out of the white scientists. <laughs> <laughs> All of which was burning every year annually. So I asked her, I said, Rita, what do you call that? And I pointed over there ambiguously where the trees are, and she said, Well, we call that the Tikwaki. Oh, Tikwaki. Uh, 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 uh. And so I looked it up later in, in Rhodes' dictionary, who'd done, he'd actually consulted her on the language that Rhodes in 80, 1986 published a, 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 a dictionary of the Ojibwe. And I looked up Tikwaki, and he had in there forest. Because as a linguist, he wasn't that interested in what Steve Packard would have to say <laughs> for scientists from the University of Illinois. So he, and he thought he'd already done the forest word and moved on. Well, uh, I didn't know what Tikwaki meant at the time before I looked it up, and, and I thought, wouldn't it be romantic if it meant the burned over bare land with trees with big nuts? <laughs> and that's when I discovered it really just meant forest, according to this linguist. Uh, in any event, we were back to the cultural center there on Walpaw Island. It was a little Sunderbach building. Uh, uh, I don't think Bill uh, uh, would think, think of this as a particularly beautiful building. It was just a square rectangular building, probably 40 by 40, not even that, a cinder box. It had uh, a little requisite uh, drug-dependent rug with some lollipop trees and poodle shrubs out in front, just like a white man would do over in Sarnia. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we were sitting there on the lawn, and I was explaining to all these grasses and weeds we were sitting on were from Europe. Was kind of you know weirded her out a little bit, you know, cause, but she had never thought about it, I guess on the lawn. It was a white man's type of situation anyway. And uh, and but behind it was a woods that had not been burning. It looked like a typical Cook County Forest Preserve or Lake County Forest Preserve had not been burning because they didn't want them to think that they were not civilized, and they, so that they they left the park unburned. And in fact, they wouldn't even admit that they burned anywhere on the island. They just said, whenever asked, uh, what, they would just say, it burns at night. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but it looks so different. And when I lived in Alaska, we had a dog, uh, and, he, and he, we named him Kinnick Kobuk. They, they see required two names. And uh, his first name, Kinnick, meant polar bear, too big, you got the water onto the ice which means that a polar bear is not too big to have water out of, out of, out of the water. It's probably had a shorter name than Kinnick. <laughs> In any event, Kobuk meant uh, big river. But anyway, the point is, they had words for things we would never have imagined growing up in Florida, that you'd need a word for polar bear to be out of the water on the ice. So Miss yeah. Woods was so different. And I, I almost didn't ask her for fear she'd reproach me and say, Jerry, I, uh, I told you already that was deep Waukee. And, but I risked it. I, I asked her, I said, Vida, what do you call that? And she said, oh, Jerry. And she shivered involuntarily. She said, we call that the Gutaqua. I thought, oh my god, the Gutaqua. But it, it didn't even did. It sounded scary to me. You know, I started shivering involuntarily. You know? and, uh, and she said, there's only one word in our language more terrifying. That's the Akakwa. I thought, oh my god, the Akakwa. And I was really terrified. And I looked there, and, and then, uh, because she said, 
you can't, if you're a little Ojibwe girl, all your life you have small pupils and great depth of field. But as you approach the Gutak clock, it's dark and bleak. Plus, she said, uh, the, the women's plants are gone. Get back to the truth. They, they've been shaded away. The women's plants, were, all of those woodland plants, and some of the prairie plants. And, um, and so it's a terrifying place. I looked up Gutak clock in, the, in Rose's dictionary. It wasn't there. Uh, but he did, but you can kind of put it together as good o'clock. It sounded like a place where your skirts get caught or grabbed or whatever. Anyway, it was, they didn't come off right. I couldn't do it. You know, just little, little, literally. And then o'clock is the edge of the good o'clock, which is the most dangerous place of all because the closer you get, the more you can't see, but they can see you. And uh, I looked up that, it wasn't in there. But aka was in there, and it was translated by Rhodes as, what a hell of a place. <laughs> and I realized then that the language you see, no, no, uh, no uh, Bodawatomi or Dawa or, or Ojibwe would tolerate having Saskuta anywhere near them. So they were burning on a regular basis, they were thinning, and they were, uh, it was part of their landscape. And in fact, the word for the prairie uh, was Skoda, had the Skoda in it, but the word for the prairie on fire, I couldn't find in Rhodes, his dictionary. It was in Padano Baraga dictionary, who was a priest uh, from a much earlier period. He described the prairie on fire as a completely different concatenation of phonemes. He said, something along that line, I hardly do it phonetically. So they had a whole different idea. And Iwi from the English, just as foyer, is from English, German, as fire, and all the baggage that goes. So our language is constantly, not only in understanding the landscape, but understanding a lot of things, our language gets in the way of understanding. Yeah. The word stormwater, for example, mm -hmm. engineers start designing for stormwater, it means you've already dropped the ball because you're no longer honoring water. We shouldn't have a word for stormwater, we shouldn't have any stormwater, only rainwater this, that, we're, that we love. In any event, mm -hmm. uh, so. Was that what you were talking about? She's drawing on your loop. What's that? Your, 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 your magnifier? Uh, your oh, oh, no, no, no. He actually, that was it. Oh. <laughs> I use the lens as a metaphor. How are you looking through the lens with, with your language? Yeah, well, so the language is very important. And, I, and you, you can't help speaking English. I can't help it. But I think that what we can learn, what I've tried to learn, is that if you speak a language and you're in a, in a land that that language didn't evolve. You, you know, when we came here in the 1620s, there were 26 language classes. We came from Europe where there were six language classes. Within each language class, except maybe Zuni, there were hundreds of languages. So, so, so for Algonquin, had hundreds, had hundreds of languages within that. And uh, so each, so that if you were growing up as an Algonquian Indian in Massachusetts, you have no need to have a name for a butte or an arroyo. Mm -hmm. You see? I mean, so their whole language is tuned in to the land where they were mm -hmm. caretakers and who loved the land, and the land had the imprimatur on their language and how it evolved. And so when you move from one place to another, you still have to be humble if your language is not well uh, evolved with that place. And this is why ecologists are constantly producing more referee papers all the time, changing their understanding of their ideas, because they're listening more to each other than they are to the plants and animals. I know you can't believe it, because I can't, but it's 4 o'clock. <laughs> um, there's one more thing I want to share with you from our conversation last week on language that I think all of you will relate to, um, which was just as simple as, how scientists look through their lens, this was, I think, your comment, and speak of things as either abiotic or biotic. So we divide things into alive and dead. And um, I'll mention this story just because my 10-year-old daughter is here. Um, but she came home from her, I think, fifth grade, it might have been fourth, and saying, Mom, there, you know, here's what I'm learning in science, we're dividing things into alive and dead. And I'd learned enough by then through this wonderful chance I have through these colleagues and works to think, well, that, you know, that is kind of odd that they're using that lens. They're having her memorize what is alive and what is dead. And she said, and even stranger, is that they're having me put water in the dead category. That, that's just wrong, isn't it? 
And um, what I, and she, she said, I know they want me to do that. I'm going to put it in the alive category and get it wrong on the test. Is that okay? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it made me think about how our lens of language can make us then say, okay, something is dead. And so I'll treat it differently. And then even thinking about our own lens of dead as unimportant rather than something to be cared for and born up into the trees. And how if we can rethink our language, rethink what it means to be a human being. And as you've opened our minds and hearts to rethinking what it means to connect with our brothers and sisters, I think uh, the future looks much better to me. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. And I think um, Catherine is going to uh, speak to us about these beautiful cards that you yes. included. So thank you. So much. Wow. Oh, I feel like we all need just a deep breath after <laughs> taking all of that in. Um, thank you, Skip and Jerry and Brooke. We have some gifts for you. Um, and I'll just make sure I skip this is for you. Um, from Brushwood Center, just a small token of our appreciation. Thank you so much. All right. So um, to conclude, well, hopefully this isn't a conclusion. Hopefully this is a beginning. Yes, absolutely. Okay. You know, I'm going to tell one quick story because this kind of when we were talking about the phone, this kind of scared Catherine. We got all kinds of stories for all kinds of stuff, and. Uh, like Jerry was saying, you know, our, our language is a descriptive language. It describes things. I just gave him some, some muscadet and washk, some, some plants that grow in those areas. Anyway, so it's about an oak grove. And it starts out with these Indians who used to come together in a big field all the time and have a fight. Two tribes, two groups, nobody knew why they were fighting. And one day they came face to face, and the two chiefs looked at each other and said, why are we fighting? And the other guy said, I don't know, because that's what we do. He said, well, isn't there something we can do to stop that? And the one said, well, I know you have a son that's marrying age, and I have a daughter that's marrying age. Why don't we make a peace and we'll have them marry, we'll arrange that marriage, and then from then on we'll all be family and we shouldn't have all this going on with people getting hurt and stuff. Great idea. So the one chief goes back to his daughter, who's a beautiful young girl, beautiful black hair. Gorgeous. Looked like Justin Bieber. <laughs> and, and when her father told her this, she she it broke her heart because she was in love with another guy. <clears throat> and she went to her special place. And I tell this story for several reasons. One reason is that everybody needs a special place. And there's no better special places than an oak grove to go and sit and be with yourself, be with your heart, think about your problems, leave things there, walk away with things, leave your garbage. I'm not talking about your McDonald's wrappers. I'm talking about the stuff that you carry in your heart. Leave that in those places. And so she ran to her secret place. And as she stood there crying, an oak tree reached down, wrapped its arms around her, and pulled her up and leaned over and whispered something in her ear. 
when the day came when they were all to meet and decide what day the marriage ceremony was going to take place, they all went back out on that plane again. And when the girl saw that guy come walking up that she was supposed to marry, she just fell to pieces because he looked like he fell out of the ugly tree. <laughs> he was a judge. So this poor girl is really broken hearted. And then she remembered what the oak tree had whispered in her ear. And what the oak tree had told her, she repeated. She said, I will marry you when all the leaves fall from the oak tree. Okay, so I challenge you to remember what the old guy said at Brushwood this winter when you're out there looking and you see the oak trees that still have leaves on them. It's still good to go. What a great story. to hear your thoughts, your inspirations from today uh, on the Dear Earth postcards. We have pens. Uh, Danny, our wonderful program coordinator, will uh, be just walking down the aisle with those. Um, and then uh, we're excited after this, we can go commune with the Oaks. Uh, Nan Buckhart from Lake County Forest Preserves is here to lead a walk on the Oak um, ecosystem restoration work that they're working on here at Ryerson. Um, so what, what better way to honor these trees and each other than actually going out and <coughs> seeing what's happening. Um, but thank you so much to our speakers today. And thank you to all of you for attending as well and, and to our artists for sharing your talent over the next couple of months. I think the power of art, of story, and of conversation um, are really where we need to be and where we need to go. So let's let's keep the conversation going forward. Um, I'll, I will just mention, you'll see on the, the little pamphlet with um, upcoming programs, we have our, our next Dear Earth series um, is uh, with Kay Buckman, who's in the audience. If you want to give a little wave, Kay. She's the featured artist of our next exhibition, Head in the Trees all about how story um, and, uh, well, how nature has influenced story throughout time, myths and legends. Um, and she'll be speaking with um, Liam Hinton and moderated by Gavin Van Horn from the Center for Humans and Nature. Um, Liam just wrote a book, uh, Beast of Bedtime, about the influence of uh, children's storybooks. Uh, which are often based in nature and include animals and plants and how that shapes our perceptions of the environment. So we hope you'll all join us for that event as well as, as, well as the many other things happening at Brushwood Center. Thank you so much. And we'll meet at the, um, do you want to meet at the front door? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone.